Hello. Today I have a bit of a... I think it might turn into a rant. Maybe. And it might be spoilery. I want to talk about The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. And uh, yeah, this is the second book I've read by Yoko Ogawa. Um, the other one I've read is The Housekeeper and the Professor. I loved this book. Um, I didn't love The Memory Police. Though the writing style is very similar and that was kind of what I liked about The Memory Police. The writing style, it was kind of sort of dreamy type thing. Um, the characters were really good. I, I cared about the characters and I liked them. Um, and those were the two things that kept me going through this book. If it wasn't for good characters and the sort of dreamy, wonderful um, writing style, I would have stopped reading this and probably should because now I have so many frustrations <laughs> with this book. So this book was uh, the book club pick for um, the Books Unbound podcast and uh, I just, I listened to the end of this, like the last half of this from about here uh, on audiobook and then I finished off, like I finished it this morning and then I listened to um, the episode on the podcast about this book and they had very good points where they, they said like for example that um, there wasn't really a resolution in this book. I guess I should talk about the premise. The premise is that things are disappearing from people's memories and it sort of starts with small things like ribbons and then bigger things like birds and the ferry and then it just escalates. It escalates a lot and um, yeah it has sort of uh, World War Two associations with um, the memory police being like sort of Gestapo like uh, and arresting people who still remember things and then um, people go into hiding and help hide other people uh, who remember things so the main character in this book um, hides her friend who remembers things and then yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think the people who wrote into the podcast or like sent in voice clips and um, Ariel and Raylene ha all had good points. And But I could see that they were coming from a point of expecting this to be a normal Western dystopian, which it is not. There is no rebellion there's no there's no real like answers given you don't know why the memory police wants to do what it does you don't know why stuff is happening um and there are very few answers really but as i see it this is a book about what people do in the situation and it reminds me of a book I read about, a graphic novel I read about um, the Second World War. A German girl who was like a young woman who was, um, what should I say, uh, like when she was young she was like opposed to Hitler and everything and then she just kind of conformed um, and that's what I felt about this. like. It is much easier to just conform, just lie down and take it. And both, like, the the main character in this book is an author. And both the main character and, like, the main character in the book that the author is writing just laid down and accepted their fate. And, I mean, it is... It is the easy thing to do and often like in this book you don't really see a recourse for what 
else to do. Like, the dystopians that we have where rebellion is sparked, that's, like, really rare. Like, would I be the one to, like, try to take down the government? Probably not, if I'm honest. Like, if I'm honest, I would just keep my head head down and, like, be dissatisfied, but still, like, go try to make my life work the best I could. And I think that is what we need to recognize with this book, is that, like, think about what your role would be in a dystopian, like, in a dystopian future where you're, where something is happening and you don't like it. Would you really, would you really make a huge plot to try to overthrow the government? Or would you just worry about whether you could find fish in the market? Like, honestly, I think that's, I think that's one of the main takeaways from this book. And one of the main takeaways that sort of the podcast kind of failed to address. But also, I really want to say that the right, like, I knew what I was expecting from Yoko Ogawa when I started this book. So I wasn't as dis- disappointed as many others, but I was thoroughly creeped out. This is a creepy, scary, sad book. And a bit of the sadness comes from the fact that people just accept their fate. They just accept the pe- things t- keep disappearing from their memories and that's just the way it is and the memory police comes for you if that doesn't happen and that's just the way it is and um I think that's what's scary in this book and I think it sort of it reaches its natural conclusion and I I don't think we should expect every main character in a dystopian to be a revolutionary. Really. And like sometimes there aren't any revolutionaries and you need a war from like outside to stop things. And I just, I think people expect too much of of people. And like, especially fictional people, like, you expect that they ask questions and that they're frustrated and they want to find out why stuff is happening when maybe you're just overwhelmed. Maybe you just can't deal with it and you just want to have food on your table tomorrow and no one to bother you. And I think it's important to see that perspective as well and not just be fed this idea that every time there's an oppressive government there must be someone and most likely like one person like a chosen one that to stand up for it I mean maybe maybe there won't be and you need to like we need to think about that we can't just like expect a revolution every time i just ah oh, i don't know <laughs> but yeah i um i think i just need to realize and i think i have mm, <laughs> that yoko ogawa's other books like except except the housekeeper and the professor are too creepy for me really just too creepy uh, I'm not very good with the creepy, as I've said before on this channel. Um, and uh, now we have it confirmed. Can't really handle the creepy. And uh, this was creepy and sad, and I probably should have stopped reading it at like the one-third mark. But I pulled through because I cared about the characters, and I enjoyed the writing style. And uh, now I'm kind of frustrated with the time that I spent on it because it gave me a lot of bad feelings, kind of. But still, yeah, I, yeah, I had feelings. <laughs> I had feelings about this, and now, 
now I've shared them. Uh, so that feels good. And now maybe I can just lay it to rest. I don't know if I'll keep this book. I don't know. But this is an example of a book I should have stopped reading, but I didn't. And now, uh, hmm. Thoughts, feelings, frustration. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think... I think that's uh, mainly what I wanted to say. And um, yeah, I'm sorry this wasn't a positive glowing review. <laughs> but if you enjoy creepy, kind of sad things that with that doesn't necessarily have a strong resolution, I think this is quite good. Um, it's a good example of her writing style as well. And um, yeah. I think there are a lot of people with mixed feelings about this book and I understand that, especially since like, I think it's the clash, some of it is the clash between Western and uh, uh, Japanese sensibilities, um, which are different, <laughs> surprise. Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway, this rant is long enough and um, <laughs> now you have, have my thoughts and feelings on this book as well, though not as positive as um, <laughs> The Starless Sea. And I'll see you next time I make a video. Bye!